Well, let's just pray. Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for your word. We ask you, Father, to just uh, touch the eyes of our understanding. Yes. Touch our ears, Father God, that we might hear yes. and be able to see and hear what you're doing. Thank yes. you, Father, for your word and your truth. Let it come forth to heal us, yes. to strengthen us, <coughs> and give us the directions that we need, Father. We thank you for it in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Yes. Okay. Uh, so the, some, some of the things that I want to say, you know, uh, I know are a little out of the box, but that's fine. I think that uh, we can, I know we can hear it here because we've kind of trained ourselves to do that. But let me just, uh, let me just mention this up front before we get started. The greatest mystery or the greatest secret that has been kept from us, from you and me, I'm not talking about secrets, mysteries. The greatest mystery and the greatest secret <coughs> that we don't know is who we are. Yep, that's, right. that's the greatest that's right. mystery. We don't know who we are. Even though it's profoundly clear, even in Scripture, who we are. And we know who we are here, don't we? We are the temple. We are the house. We are the dwelling place of God. Now, to say that and to own that are different. Totally different. You can say it for a long, long time and never own it. But as you begin to own that idea, that idea will reshape your life. It will change you. and you'll, The way it will change you is you begin to realize you're not really looking for certain things way out yonder because you realize you already are the past, the present, and the future. Now, you always, you'll notice that you are living now in that reality. Did, did you have some? Yeah, story? along what you're, you're introducing as we get here to start this morning, it tells us in two different passages at the beginning of Revelation, God proclaimed us kings and priests. And if you really want to analyze that, that's saying, what do you think of when you think of a king? That's somebody with all the authority in the world and the natural. What do you think of as a priest? They've got all the spiritual authority. God is saying you have all of the authority. You are a right. king and you are a priest. And over in 1 Peter, he says something very sim similar and calls us a holy nation. Right. And exactly. that's what scripture says. We are. God called us, not whoever wrote right. that. Exactly. Exactly. Now, I can say that dozens and dozens of times. And again, I come back to this very thing until you own that. Mm -hmm. And owning that will begin to reshape and transform your reality. No matter what your reality is, if that reality is you've been beat up by life, you've been crippled by sickness and disease, or bound up. Now that's just the physical. Really where the bondage gets is in the psychological. And that's the one, we don't, we don't see that. We can see physical defects. We can hear the physical sicknesses and the different things that pull us down. We can see that. We can hear that. And we're very in tune to that. But when it gets to the psychological things, it's deep within us. <coughs> that it just lays deep down in our psyche. That's a whole different story. We hide that real well. And then the hiding of those psychological things, that's where many other traumas and problems crop out in our life. So anyway, I don't want to talk about that. And it's coming back to what Steve said. It's coming back to the king and the priest. It's coming back to the spiritual and the natural and merging them and making them one. Make those two one. And that's what, that's your work. That's not my work. That's your work. Every individual is personally on that path to unite and to make itself one, to make itself strong. So, uh, our knowledge, for the most part, and when I talk about knowledge, I'm talking about gnosis. I'm not talking about accumulation of that which we get from others. I'm talking about that which you are in tune to yourself intuitively. And, and we don't. We get away from that when we're little, young children. 
we kind of lean into that intuitive thing. But the older <coughs> we get, we get further and further away from that intuitive nature. That, that intuitive nature is deep within you. Mm -hmm. And that intuitive nature is a very present thing that, you know, sometimes have you ever had just this, this notion or this thought or this intuition and you ignored it and then went down the road a little further, ah, oh, I should have done that. Yeah. yeah. So it's coming back to that and let, and letting that be a very vital, very vital part of our life. That's what I'm talking about. What I'm talking about knowledge. I'm not talking about the kind of knowledge you get because you read a book. I'm talking about that intuitive knowledge that comes from gnosis. That was the early church movement that was called the Gnostics or gnosis. And so coming back to that is where we begin to walk in the spirit. That's what that is about. Intuition is walking in the spirit. So coming to that connection that we have psychologically. And there's not there's been, I would say Carl Jung probably began to bring more of that out, but Carl Jung tied it into ancient Hebrew, into Kabbalah. And a lot of people didn't know that, but a lot of his psychoanalysis and different things that he began to bring forth a hundred, a little over a hundred years ago with the Jungian uh, um, psychology has really changed the world and is continually to do that, continuing to change the world because he's bringing us back to some roots that we have forgotten that we have. And so that, basically that's what I want to do. I want to bring us back to some roots that that we have. So I want you to look with me at a couple of passages in the New Testament and then guess what? We're going to wind up back in the Old Testament. <laughs> I better be the book of Genesis. You, you, yeah. Philippians, if you can find these places, I just want you to look at them. Uh, Linda, would you get them a Bible? Linda, you stay up there. You sit down. You don't need to be up there. Perfect. I appreciate it. Just go to your... Go to your index, put your put you a finger or marker your index, tell you what page to go to. And find the book of Philippians. Find Philippians and find the book of Romans. They're they're not far apart. Um, and I want you to uh, look at these with me. Um, Philippians and Romans. <coughs> Philippians chapter 2. Everybody there? Philippians chapter 2. I just wait on everybody to see, see this because. Um, Philippians chapter 2. <laughs> Everybody there? Verse 2 says, Fulfill ye my joy, that you may be like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord and of one mind. Mm -hmm. Verse 5, Let this mind be in you. Mm -hmm. Some people would say it this way, Let this mind be you. Mm -hmm. It is in you. But for you to connect to it, again, is... is tapping into that which is already there within you. Let this mind be you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of a man, of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made of himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant <coughs> and was made in the likeness of men. So the example that Paul is giving us here about the Christ, that oil, that anointing that's in you. You have to understand, they, in Greek mythology, they understood Christ is not a personal pronoun, nor is it the name of an individual. That's a difficult hurdle to get over. Christ is a verb, it's an action, it's an oil. It comes from the word Christos and actually means oil. Got translated in some cases for anointing oil. But it refers to an oil that functions in your body that your psychological or your mind or your nerve system runs on. In other words, that oil is like the track and there's not hardly anywhere in your body, I'm going to go out on a limb and say nowhere in your body that that oil is not because that, that oil is attached to every nerve in your body. 
and runs through your body, through the, the brain and the, and the stem, the whole, mm -hmm. the whole column there. That's where, that's where at, it's at. And if, so if you took a pen and pricked your finger, would you feel it? Yes. Mm -hmm. Of course you would. Why? Why would you feel it? There's a nerve there. Mm -hmm. <laughs> your body is, is really nervous. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> it's got nerve endings yeah. everywhere. Yeah. Now, now, if you can connect to that, let me just say this up front. And I'm quoting this from Manly P. Hall. Manly P. Hall said in the ancient temples, all of the temples, temples whether they were in, whether they were in Greek or Rome or Egypt or China or India, it doesn't matter where they built these phenomenal temples. All the temples were built on the physical anatomy of the human body. And within those temples, they use mannequins. I use a whiteboard. In those temples, they used a mannequin with a man or a woman and their organs and their vital parts. And so when you come to the temple, you came to the temple not to uh, cry out for your sins, but you came to the temple to get saved, or in other words, the word saved from the Greek word sozo means to make you whole. In other words, to connect your psychological to your physical so that you would be psychophysical, so that the two would be one. In other words, the way that you think and the way that you are would be one. And so they use those mannequins as teaching methods to, to say here's this, this, and this. Yeah. And they would align those different organs or fu functions and parts of the body with the astrological wheel mm -hmm. and how that it would line up with different planets, different places out in the, uh, in, in the heavens, out in the space. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's, that's pretty phenomenal. So I use a marker board because I don't have a mannequin big enough. You know? mm -hmm. If I had an old mannequin that I could just open it up, and show you the vital parts. I would, that would be phenomenal if I could do that. Mm -hmm. I do have a, uh, a book. It's, it's a fairly large book. It's this wide and this high. And it has open, I can open pages on it and show different parts like the nervous system, the blood system, mm -hmm. uh, different systems of the body. And I probably ought to start bringing it out because, mm -hmm. because there's so much correlation between what's in Scripture and the ancient text in the script and what what we have not heard that is the truth mm -hmm. and to make the connection to so let this mind be in you even though you are a man mm -hmm. but I look at that again I want you to see that because he didn't he didn't count it robbery to be called equal with God you, we have a real hard time getting that there huh can, can, you, can you say I'm equal with God? If you say that many times you have that blockage in the back of your mind that says, no, you're not. <laughs> you did this, you did that, da, da, da. and then the list goes on because of religious conditioning based off beliefs that religion shoved down our throats. And we, we have been taught to believe those things and think those are the truth when they're not the truth. They're just beliefs in which we change these things just like we change clothes. Mm -hmm. People constantly changing their beliefs, their ideas. But truth, you don't have to change truth. It just, it is, it's, it's that. So being equal with God. That's a hurdle right there. I know that it is. All right, go with me over to Romans chapter 8 because I'm going to get into some things here in a few minutes. And I, and I promise you, I know that this will challenge what you have been taught to think. I know that. And I, and I don't mean it to be disrespectful in what you've been taught to think. What I want us to do is to think that maybe what we've been taught to believe is not the truth. I go out, I'm not going out on a limb to call it a lie. I'm just simply saying it is not the truth. And you, I think you'll be able to see this. I hope, pray that, I, I hope that you will be, but I think you will. So if you found Romans chapter 8, look at verse 5. It says, Paul said this, For they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh, but they that are after the Spirit, 
the things of the Spirit. And you see, your mind can go in two different directions simply because your mind is not just locked into a certain position or into a, it can be carnal or it can be spiritual. It's the same mind. It's not two separate minds. It's the same mind. That mind is the link that connects you to the divine source that you really are. That mind is called your soul. How many of you have one? Of course you do. What is it? Most people, I don't know. <laughs> I know we don't know what it is, but we say we got one. And many times when we say that we, are, we have a soul or we are a soul, many times we equate that with the spirit. The spirit is the breath of life that lives you. Everybody has that too. But you have a spirit and you have a soul and they're not the same and they don't have the same function. Yet they are, they are designed to come together in a unison in your body and make your body the very temple, the very tabernacle, the very dwelling place that the divine lives in. My, 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 my. Okay, verse 5. For they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh. They that are after the Spirit, the things of the, spe of the Spirit. Verse 6. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Mm -hmm. In other words, you can, you can put your focus on whichever one you want to. It's not right or wrong. Mm -hmm. One of them will, ma will make you feel like you're in hell, <laughs> and you'll live there. And the other one will make you feel like you're in heaven, and you'll live there. And either one of those is not separate destinations that you got to go to. In other words, y'all going to all go out there to heaven somewhere or out in space, or you're all going to go to hell wherever that's at, and ain't nobody ever found. Other than the true meaning of the word, the true meaning of the word hell was actually the word heel, which means a mound from a hole dug in the ground. That's what it meant. So. If you, look up the, if you look up the word Sheol in Hebrew, it's both the word hell and the word grave. Same word, and not any different. So where is hell? It's the grave. <laughs> That's where your body rots and goes right back into the earth where it's supposed to. Because your body's made up of all of the gases, the four elements comes from the periodic table. Of all, everything that's here on this earth, your body's made up from. But yet God made you unique and different and put something different in you. What was that? He put, put the portion of itself in you that gives you the ability to both think and communicate, both to talk, uh, to have all the attributes that God is. Because the attributes that God is peace and love and joy, sound mind, all these. God is not hate. God is not jealous. God is not angry. All of those are attributes of mankind and we build a God in our image and we gave that God the attributes of ourself. And now we're terrified of that God. <laughs> Most of them, oh, hell no, I don't want to meet him. <laughs> no, if I get to go, I want me a proxy. I've got to have somebody stand between me and him because he knows what I've been doing. <laughs> He's seen me. Yeah, you're exactly right. <laughs> he knows your downsetting, but he knows your uprising. <laughs> he knows everything in your closet. So, I mean, I it, it's not one iota hid from God. Now, then, I want to make a statement here, and I'm going to use some characters that I know some of you've never heard. You know, and you, most people do know I I read a lot of books. I read a lot. I have a I have a phenomenal accumulation of books. Many of the characters in the Bible were not. I'm going to repeat this. Many of the characters. I'm not going to, I'm not going to just go out. I almost would go out on a limb and say all of them. But I'm not going to do that. I'm going to say many of the characters, maybe most of the characters in the Bible are not literal and they're not historical. I know that's difficult for people because you're taught up front they are historical. I'm going to talk about some of those characters and show you why they are not literal characters and why they are not historical characters. Many times those characters represent different facets of your life that you've lived through or that you're living in right now. Mm -hmm. and, and the characters, their names, the stories around them will show you that depiction if you have an eye to see it. 
or if you'll just open yourself up outside your box, and that's difficult, and I know it is, open yourself outside your box, because most people are afraid if they do that, that, oh my God, they get in a lot of trouble. The devil might be out there and get you. <laughs> now, many of the characters, if not most of the characters, are not literal, they're not historical, but they are mythical and they are symbolic. When I'm saying the word mythical, I'm going back to its original meaning. The word myth originally meant a fabulous story. You hear that? It was a story. They knew it was a story. Most of the stories were told orally. They weren't written down. They were just told orally. The American Indians practiced that same method of orally telling stories and orally initiating you. And in that initiation and in the hearing of that story, it would touch something within you. It would spark and ignite a deposit of God that's already in you. And then that story would give you a purpose for being. It would give you inspiration to live. It would, uh, it would just ignite some marvelous things. That's what a myth is. Today, they have tried to convince you and me that a myth is a lie. Just exactly like they're doing on the political scene to give you a, a fake scenario that's not true, but try to tell you that it's true. And we are so gullible. <laughs> we, we'll believe a lie and call it the truth and then die for it. Yeah. And that is, that is sad, but that's, mm -hmm. that's what happens to us so often. So these characters were not literal, they were not historical, they were symbolic characters, and they represent the higher truth that lives inside you. So when I go back and I say Moses was not a character that lived back then, you are Moses. <laughs> and I know, huh? I had not split no Red Sea. You don't realize you have. You, the, the Red Sea actually is the Reed Sea, which is actually the heart chakra, and every one of you have crossed the path of your heart chakra. Some of you got stuck in the miry mud of it, and some of you allowed the Spirit to breathe in front of you and dried it out as you walked across. Every one of you. Every one of you are constantly crossing your read, R-E-E-D, C, which is your heart. Nobody can deal with that but you. Nobody can walk that path but you. If you go back and you look at the historical literal story, there is not one way possible, period, to move that many people. Some say three million, some say six million, plus children, animals, etc., across a path that narrow within just a few hours. It can't be done. It's the same is true when you take some of the stories like I told you a few weeks ago. You can accept the story of a Samson with a jawbone of an ass killing a thousand trained soldiers by his single hand if you think like a five-year-old child. But if you think like an adult, you realize that's impossible. It can't be done. You can't, you can't you tell me that ten men, twenty men, trained men knowing how to take somebody down can't figure out a way to trick you and get Oh no, with God. I mean, he ain't God. He's just twirling like a top, just swinging his sword and cutting everybody's head off. That's a five year old brain. <laughs> Think through it a little bit more with a rational mind. No, those are symbolic stories that have tremendous content and intent when you start to see them in the fashion that they were told. Now, Genesis chapter 1, that's where you can go if you want to find that place that I want to read you something that I wrote here and I want to tell you about some characters that are not historical and they are not literal. Okay? Genesis chapter 1, if you want to go over there. The first character I want to talk about or mention, I want to just mention this character to you that's not historical and didn't live And that's the character named Adam. Now you know, ha, oh, Brother Lynn, you know good and well there had to be an Adam. Only in Christianity. You know what? You have approximately 2 billion Christians in the world over the world of approximately 8 billion people. 
Only in Christianity are we gold enough to believe that. Anywhere else they realize it is a fabulous story and it's a mythical story, but no, there was not a literal Adam that lived 6,000 or 7,000 years. It was not. And I'll prove that to you in just a minute, but let me give you a list of some guys. Eve. Now this, this one is, this is way over the top. No, Eve is not, and Eve's mentioned twice in the Old Testament. Twice. But you would think somebody that's as important as she would be to the Christian ideology that she would be at least mentioned more than two times. But she's not. Because Eve don't even mean she in Hebrew. Has, it doesn't mean she. It's not a man's wife. I'm sorry, <laughs> brother, brother. It has to be. Now let me read. Let me give you some others. Moses, Noah. These are not literal characters. These are mythological characters, and, and and the list goes on. But now here's some that I bet you don't. You've never heard of. You ever heard of Adonis? Have you ever heard of Romulus? Have you ever heard of Krishna? Have you ever heard of Dionysus or Zoroaster or Attis or Horus? All of these were born of a virgin and none of them were real, were historical, were literal. Can you think of another character you could add to that list that was born of a virgin? In other words, wasn't touched by a man? I know you can, but you didn't know that all of these characters, actually there are 15 what's called dying and resurrecting God men known in history. Wow. Fifteen that are known in history all over the world that were fabulous stories told. I've only I've only give you an eight or so nine, mm. and I have you know I have researched and read of all of these different. Every one of these characters represented something symbolic of the truth that's already inside you, mm -hmm. knowing that that energy is inside me. The energy to raise me up. Someone said, I've been resurrected from the dead. That's what that, that's what that energy is all about. And we put a character with it. And then when we make that character historical and literal, we actually take away from the power of that character because, or the story of that character, because now we say that character did it, but I can't. And those are the, these are the solace. Let's take this first character that I mentioned, Genesis chapter 1. And uh, I want to put this character on the board. And I want to show you something. Genesis chapter 1, and look at verse 25. It says, And God made the beasts of the field after his kind, and cattle after their kind, and everything that creeps upon the earth after his kind. And God saw that it was good. And God said, Let us make man. Now, do you see that word, man? Man? All right, I'm going to put it up here on the board, and I'm going to spell it for you. Alif. Dalit. Final meal. Now, this is the Hebrew spelling of this word, and it's the word man. It's also the same word, Adam. Same word, same word. What is what is it's not a personal pronoun. It's not referring to an individual character. What it actually is referring to is all of humankind. <coughs> That's what the word means. Alif Dali. Men. This is a 600, has a 600 value, this has a 4 value, and this has a 1 value, which gives you uh, 605 total, which gives you 11. Now you see, all I'm doing is I'm taking these numbers, and I'm going to take this word and reduce this word through gematria. <coughs> gematria means to just take a, a number and reduce that number to its lowest value. So if I take the, this value of this glyph, this glyph, this glyph, 604 and 1 is 605. 6 and 5 is 11. Everybody follow that? Reducing it to its lowest number. And 1 and 1 equals what? 2. 
Well, if I were to take two in the Hebrew, that's the Beth. <coughs> Follow this? this? That's the Beth. Mm -hmm. What does the word Beth mean? It means house. <coughs> it means container. It means you are humankind, the house, the container of God. Mm -hmm. So the story of this particular character that you want to call man and put a male picture to it is not correct. That's not who it's talking about. It's talking about the house, the dwelling place where God lives. So every place that I see this word man or Adam, that's what it's referring to. It's referring to the... Now, would that be referring to you? Yeah. You can nod your head and say, yeah, that's all about me. I am the house. I am the dwelling place where God lives. We just read it in Paul's writings. We just quoted it in 1 Corinthians 4 and 6. Don't you know you're the house? You're the temple. You're, the, you're, you're where God lives, dwells. Hallelujah. So now that when you go back and you read Genesis 1, 2, and 3, it's going to be really hard, nearly impossible for you to erase from your mind when you read the word man that is only talking about this male species, this male character that God took out of a mud puddle and molded and shaped him. And there he stood and he had all male parts. You follow me? In other words, it weren't you unless you were like me, a man. And then God goes, and then he goes streaking through the garden, just running naked as a jaybird. Hallelujah! <laughs> That's the image you have. That's incorrect. And it's hard to take that image out of your mind and put the correct image there. The image for the word man and Adam is humankind. You. So every place that you see that word and it has the two value. That's what it's talking about. It's talking about the temple, the Beth. That's the Hebrew glyph, Beth, or Veth, which means the house of container. So that's the first place that we go. This word right here, Adam, Adam, comes from the root word. Dom, Dom. comes from the root word you can you can see it right here in oh, why my marker is given out on this this is the root and this word right here is called sounds like down but it's not dawn and what this word means, blood. Leviticus 17. The blood is the life of all flesh. I mean, you can, if you want to, you can go over there and you can look at it. It's Leviticus 17, 14. The life of all flesh is in the blood. Why my markers doing that? Give me another. Oh. And that's dawn, blood. Now, you know, again, I wish I had the mannequin. I wish I had that character I could open him up and show you. Because again, I'll give you the same analogy I gave you with the nerve. If I took a if I took a pen and pricked your finger, you would feel it, and guess what else you'd do? You'd bleed. Because it's not anywhere in your body. And you know what that word right there, don't mean? It means red. What's the numerical value? Yeah, yeah. Look at the map. Look at the value of this one right here. Six hundred and four equals six hundred and four equals ten, which equals one, which is God. See, so you see that? That's not complicated. It's rather simple once you get the, the flow of the of gematria, 
You get the flow of the Hebrew glyphs. You get to understand. This is how you define a word in Hebrew. Just exactly like we're doing right now. And so it gives you a clearer picture of what this scripture is saying to us. What it's, what it's trying to convey. Because what we have been told historically, literally, is not true. It, it is so far way off from where truth is at. And that's so hard. I know it's hard. I know it's difficult. So the same word for Adam and man is the same word. And they do not refer to a male. Now, the first place that we see the word male is in Genesis chapter 2. So if you would, just turn over with me to Genesis chapter 2. Now every place that you go through Genesis 1, 2, and 3 and you read the word man or you read the word Adam, it's the same identical word and it's referring to humankind. But where do we come up with, because I know what you're thinking, well where is man and woman? Or where is male and female? Or where is husband and wife in this story? It is, it is here, but it's not here but just a few times. Here's the first place that we will find. Genesis chapter 2, verse 22. Everybody, everybody there? 2, 22, it says, And the rib which the Lord God had taken from man, the word rib is actually a sail. This first building block is a sail. And that's what the word real means. This is not a this is this is a anatomical declaration. It's not a historical declaration where God did anesthesia on him and then jerked a rib out of his side, just broke one out, said, You don't need this one. I'm gonna take this one out. That, that word real is means sail. First building block. It's a building block to build an organ or any part of your physical body. You've got to have a sail. And it says, and he had taken from man. Well, oddly enough, this particular word right here, man, is not, look here, it's not Adam. This, this word right here, and I want you to look at this word uh, and see the difference. Alif, Yod, Sheen. Now, you see the difference? This is translated for man. It's translated man. Okay? But this word is esh. E-esh. Can, can you hear the difference? E-esh. Adam. This means humankind. This means male. Actually, the word e-esh means male or the producer of a seed. Okay? And this word is this word comes from the root of it is Alif Sheen. And this is the word for fire. It's used in Deuteronomy chapter four for God. God is. I'm not going to take time to take all these scriptures and show you that. It, it takes forever. I'll just tell you where it's at. Deuteronomy chapter 4. God is a consuming fire. That word fire is esh. This word for man is esh. The word fire means seed. The word esh means male with seed. Where did he get his seed? He got his seed from the fire of God. If you look at the human seed, the semen of a man, you look at that semen, it's made up of three components. One of those components is light, which is fire, which is God. So when that man releases that component into, notice what it says next here, if you're there in Genesis, Made he woman. You see that word woman? Mm -hmm. 
that is not the word for Eve. That word woman. Is e esha. Of course, it comes from the root e esh, male. E esha. Now obviously, you can say that that's not that's woman. And actually, that word woman means womb for seed. It means the womb. Or actually, it's the deposit, it's the womb of fire. And it's, it's just, you see, this is the only place that you find. And this same word, Esha, is also the word for, is also the word for wife. Okay, let's, let's do Jamatra on these words. This man, this is one, this is ten. This is 300. So this is 310 11. So this equals 311, which equals 5. 5 means, it, number 5 in Hebrew is the hay, and the hay is feminine, or it has female <laughs> productive ability. It means it can procreate. Both male and female can do that. Man has the seed, woman has the egg. They have to come together. To miraculously creep, but both have that number five. Hey, they have that female, I mean, they have that productive ability to create, to procreate. And if you look at the word fire, you have 300, you have one, which equals uh, 301, which equals four, and four is a major, major word that's used in Hebrew that means the manifestation of. Anything on the earth that's manifest. It may, basically the four corners of the earth, four winds, the full fire, the earth fire, <coughs> air and water, the four gases, carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen, oxygen, all of those things that that you come from that, that uh, builds you. And then you have Esha, woman, which is this hay has a five value, 301. So this has, look at this, 305. Six, is that right? Mm -hmm. 306, which equals nine. Nine is the divine number. It's the te'at. Nine is the manifestation of the olive. Nine is the miracle number. You can Google that on your phone. You, you can take nine, multiply it by any number, take any number that you want, to put nine, multiply it by nine, and it'll reduce back to nine. Doesn't matter, you just Google it, it'll blow your mind. That's woman. Uh, and that and this is this is her manifestation. So uh, these are the only two male and females mentioned in Genesis 1, 2, and 3. The name man and the name Adam is not referring to a male species. This does. Ash, that refers to a male species, one who carries the seed. Now, this comes to this, this, uh, this next word is only mentioned twice, and it's in Genesis chapter three. Just flip over there, if you will, Genesis chapter three. You know, and, and I'm sorry the translators so garbled this up. It is so gobbled up, but inside the story, inside all of this scrambling of these Hebrew glyphs and words, is the truth. And it's just like the, the truth is inside yourself, but you have to go and do the work to get in there to find it. But I tell you, there's a lot of confusion and a lot of mess around getting into the core of your being and finding the truth that's there. 
And, and, and you have to roll up your sleeves. And you have to do it if you choose to do it. Otherwise, you don't want. It's a whole lot easier to ignore all of this stuff. And just say, ah. And then just keep on keeping on doing what you've been doing. And that's fine if that, you know, if that's where you're at. But if you're hungry and you want more or you want to go a little bit deeper, then you're going to have to roll up your sleeves and do some research. And when you do, you're going to be totally amazed at what you find. Because what you're going to begin to find, you're going to begin to find your true self. And oh my God, when you find your true self, you will begin to find that which you have longed for, that which is peaceful, that which is love, that which is unlimited. You find your true self. You'll find you walking on water self. <laughs> You'll find your fire breathing self. You'll find your miraculous self. You'll find yourself that God designed to walk and live on the earth and that God gave dominion over all of the earth and everything in it. And every one of us longs to find that self even though we stuffed it away somewhere and said, oh no, it's too much work to get there. It's a whole lot easier to go to church, sing flying away songs, how wonderful it'll be over there on streets of gold and when I get to my cabin or my mansion, whichever I built, I sent some, maybe I sent a prayer or two up and made it, and I got me a cabin in the corner of the Lord. It's so much easier to get all tickled and uh, have my goosebumps, and uh, you know, if you're Pentecostal or apostolic, you can run the aisle, swing from the chandeliers, have goosebumps, and then go away your miserable self just like you were before you got there. Or you can go to one of the other traditional things that it's all sweet and glorious while you're there. Then you've got to go back and deal with the real world. Mm -hmm. Or you can find the truth and live in the truth and walk in the truth all of the days of your life and transform everything around you. Yes. Choice, because it belongs to you. It belongs to any one of us. It's not right or wrong. You know, that's the whole thing. I remember years and years ago when I would say that, that nobody did anything wrong here. That blue, I remember I was doing a conference somewhere. I, I was in Greenville, North Carolina doing a conference. Now this has been 25 years ago and I said that and there was a large crowd of people, a couple hundred people there. And all of a sudden some guy screamed out, you mean that nobody made a sin? I said, absolutely not. There is no sin or no mistake made by anybody in Genesis 1, 2, and 3. <laughs> And I remember the guy real well. He hollered, Hallelujah! <laughs> He'd never heard that before. It rewrites the whole program if you think about it. Because it does put God in a position of being divine and sovereign. Flawless. No mistakes. And creating a, something that's in its image. Flawless. No mistakes. Would that be me? That'd be you. <laughs> now your physical body, he puts your physical body in a dimension of hot and cold. He puts your body in a dimension of contrast. He puts your body in a dimension of health and sickness. He puts your body here where it can prove out what it can do and what it's designed to do in this dimension. But it's up to you and me to allow that to happen, to let that happen. So here we come to this character in Genesis chapter 3. And oh my goodness, all around this character. Verse 20, And Adam called his wife's name, you see this? And Adam called his wife's name Eve. Eve. And actually the word is Chava in Hebrew. The word Chava. And the word Chava, well, let me go ahead and put it up here. We're out of board. But uh, <coughs> I don't know if you can, I have to. Uh, this is Cheot, this is Bob, and this is Hay. This has a five value. This has a six value, and this has an eight value. And when you add them together, six and five are 11, and eight equals what, 19? And when you add that together, nine and one gives you what? 10. 10, which gives you one. Brings you back to the divide. 
She represents the divine, the create, the creator, the creative aspect. And that's why she's called the mother of living. Or she's called the mother of life. It's not Adam's wife's name. The Eshah <coughs> and Esha were the male and female characters. The male and female characters here in Genesis 1, 2, and 3 is, are these two characters here. Eesh and Eesha. Those are the two characters. And of course, she's mentioned twice. She's mentioned right here, and she's also mentioned in the fourth chapter, three verses on down. Four verses on down. And that's it. That's all she's mentioned in, the, in the, all the Old Testament. Now, I, and I don't have the time to do it. I, I wanted to get to this because I wanted to get to the two important characters. And I'm going to go ahead and introduce this anyway. I'll get this maybe on this part of the board real quick. Two important characters that are totally overlooked. One of them is not so much overlooked. The other one is totally overlooked and given a false description. But they are the characters that actually make this male and female function and live and move and have their being in the earth realm. And that character is mentioned in Genesis 2-7. Back over there, Genesis 2-7. And these are very confused, but they are very important. Genesis 2, 7 says, And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground. I'm going to say this. Let me read this to you kind of in how Hebrew would say this. It says, And the Lord God yitzare. That word yitzare in Hebrew means to squeeze out or fashion. The word man is adam, which I just got through telling you that it is not a personal pronoun of a name. It's actually the, the energy of God or the olive number one in blood which every human being has that so in Hebrew that's what this the formation of man out of the afar the word dust afar does the word afar in Hebrew means particles of light <laughs> particles of light or in other words you could say fire dust you thought it meant dirt, didn't you? <laughs> Every one of you, I know, you saw that dust. You thought, oh God, God's put a little spit there. He had a mud ball. Because, I mean, that's, a, that's what you're going to think. Doesn't mean that. It means particles of light. Fire dust. That's what the word means. Fire dust. Where do you think the fire dust comes from? I mean, my God, we got songs. Some of the, some of the uh, rock and roll bands, they get out there on... Who knows what? <laughs> they get out there on some drugs. They tap into some stuff and write songs out of it. Now what's this? <coughs> the Lord God formed Yitzar, squeezed out, formed Adam, man, uh, blood, from the particles of light of the ground. You see that word ground? That's the word Adama. Adama. It's, you take this word right here Adam, Alif, Dalit, Final, Mim, with a head. Adamah. It called ground. And again, it, it means miracle substance. <laughs> That's what He made you out of. This is what God shaped and fashioned you out of. The miracle substance of what? Stardust, particles of light. My goodness, you start. To, you know, I'm, I'm getting into anatomy 101. If we had a mannequin here and we could, and we begin to do some research in in cellular structure and the building blocks of the physical body and uh, the chemical charts, all of these things, as you begin to see how this amalgamation of of stuff is formed together and God says, mm, look at this. And all it really needs is breath. 
And that's exactly what God gives it at the end of chapter 3 when He delivers it from the womb, from the embryonic sac, where it says that there were the, the cherubims, the cherubims, karub, Hebrew karub, which means ability to imagine a thing. They were there, two of them on the top of that, and they were placed at the garden, at the, at the, at, where the child, the water broke, the water breaks and the child is delivered to come forth. God breathed it. Now, and they breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became what? He became a living soul. A living soul. Uh, non. A. This has a 300 value, this has an 80 value, and this has a 50 value, which equals 430. Help me with my math, y'all. Looks like 70 to me. Is that right? That close, huh? 430, which equals 7. This is the 7. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. This is the, this is the structure of the human body, which the divine mind. This is the mind of God. Let this mind be you, and this is the ability to produce it. Teot, manifest, manifest. Make it make it visible. Make it seen. The making it visible, the making it seen is the real production or the real manifestation of the product. That's what's real. That that's not seen is not what's real. That that's not seen is only an idea. That that's seen, i.e. you, you are the real deal. <laughs> you are the real deal. And, you know, look in the mirror the next time and don't just see that reflection that's outward that you're looking at. Look deeper into it. Look into the windows of the soul. Look into the interior part of you and say to yourself, I'm the real deal. I'm well. I'm healed. I'm whole. I'm, I'm, I'm everything that God is. I'm peaceful. I'm prosperous. I'm healthy, etc. So, well, I don't, I don't feel that. Say it till you feel it. <laughs> That's the soul. Now watch this. Now this is this is easy. So far, this hadn't already really been hard for all of you. If you can just out of your box a little bit and just entertain the thought with me, just a little. but the next one. Now this is going to be really difficult. Genesis chapter three and verse one. We'll close with this one right? because I want to take these two because tying these two together is tying the psychological and the physiological, and that way you get a psychophysiological entity. And that's who you are. Yeah. You've got to marry the two. You've got to merge these two. You've got to let the two be one. Mm -hmm. And this next one, you will fight King Stream. Mm -hmm. Now the serpent. Oh, there it is. Serpent. That's the one. That's the one we're looking for. Look at this word, serpent. Non. Sheat. Sheen. This has a 300 value. Watch this. 300, of course, she. This has an 8 value. And this has a 50 value. That would equal 358, which equals what? 16? Which equals what? 7. Same thing as the soul because it's referring to the same thing. This is the serpent. Your physical body. Wow. The nachesh. You see, the nachesh and the nachesh are designed to work as unisons. They are designed to work together. Here's the way they're designed to work. They're designed to do just exactly like that. They look like a serpent on a pole. And that pole happens to be the backbone that's in your body connected to the throne, which is the head. 
In other words, the serpent is the nerve system that runs up and down your body that gives you the experiences of living life. That's what that word means. Learn by experience. Yes. Whew, glory to God. Yes. Learn by experience. That word also, nafesh, it means to diligently observe. In other words, watch it. Look at it until you become it. Wow. These two, the soul and the serpent, are two vital links to give you a physiological, psychological connection so that you can let the two, the divine and the human, become one in you. Hallelujah. In manifestation. Mm -hmm. Ooh, my, my, my. <laughs> I wanted to uh, I'll read you some notes I wrote in the bottom of this whole book. The psychophysical, this is what Genesis 3 is all about. The serpent is what connects the psyche, the soul, to the physical, the natural, the human. This connection is where we become aware of who we are like God. That's what it said in Genesis 1.26, first passage we read. I made you in my image and after my likeness. Genesis chapter 3, after the woman ate the knowledge, she said, ha, we are like God. And they've told me and you ever since then, oh no, you don't want to do that. That's the very thing you do want to do. That's right. <laughs> Every one of you wants to be like God. There is something that's inside you that wants to be that. And, and, and you are. We are. We are designed to be like God and be co-creators with God. That's what Paul said in Philippians. Don't think it robbery <coughs> to be equal with God. Oh God! Well, let me tell you, you can't. You know, you tell most anybody that, and they, uh, uh. No. I remember a story. I this my story when I told my mama. I thought, well, the two things I need to do. I've had this dream. I don't dream a lot. And don't remember if I do. And then that dream, God took me just directly to. I think it was Numbers 19. And said, this is, this is what I want you to do. And it read to me, it says, I have called you to be a priest, a, king, a kingdom of nations. Mm -hmm. no, no. I said, oh my God, you mean you want me to be a preacher? <laughs> I, mean, I mean, you know, God, you know how many times I've been in jail? <laughs> I mean, you know, my life has not really been a very picture-perfect thing. I mean, you know, it's been kind of, I was pretty rowdy little feller. And I got up and argued with that, and I thought, well, I, I have two women in my life at that time that I need to let, I need to tell this. And so I told Connie, and she said, I didn't marry you to be no preacher's wife. Mm -hmm. And I thought, and I went and talked to my mother, and I said, Mom, God wants me to be a preacher. And she said, that ain't no way. She said, I got you out of jail too many times. <laughs> well, that's been 45 years ago, 46, 47 years ago. <laughs> And here we are. All things are possible. <laughs> All things are possible. All right, so to be continued. So I, I want to make this connection between the, the physical and the psychological. And I know this is, and I, and I really enjoy Carl Jung. I read some of his works and I uh, associated with him. And probably I would have wouldn't have mind being a psychologist or a psychiatrist, you know, with the information that I have studied and learned over the years to see how the, the suki, which is the psychological, and the physical, which is the material natural, have been merged together, divinely welded and wedged together. And we want this condolinia energy flowing up and down our spine. So that, you know, we, we have that inspiration. We have that uh, strength to be what God's called us to be. Okay, oh, well, let me quit rapping. Any questions?